Hey everybody, um, like she said, my name's Dave. Uh, I work here as a delivery captain, but most of the time I'm here to charter boat fishing. So um, I've been doing it for a long time, uh, almost 35 years. So I've uh, been doing it since I was a kid and young man. So, um, but anyhow, what we're gonna talk about tonight is just the basics of bottom fishing. Um, 90% of our fishing that we do here in this area is based off of reefs or artificial reefs or man-made structures out there that we fish for our red snapper, grouper, trigger, porgies, mingos, all that stuff. It's all basic the same concepts. And when I get out, one of the biggest questions that I hear a lot is just talking about how to control the boat, what to do as far as conditions and current and everything. And that's kind of what I want to show, show you guys today. And please, if you have any questions, just stop me at any time and we'll talk about it. But I've got, I got basically um, five different rigs here um, that I use 90% of the time when we're out fishing. So, um, and, and we're, we're gonna talk primarily about snapper fishing right now because that's what's in season right now. And hopefully you guys had got out and it was a really good kickoff to the snapper season. And then it kind of slowed down. The fish got real finicky and they, Kind of slowed down a little bit then today we went out there and we got our limit in 45 minutes so um and i'm talking the smallest fish we had on board was 18 inches today i had six guys on the boat and we the smallest one we had was 18 inches and the biggest one was like 26. um so we are getting some good ones on so they what's today tuesday yesterday on monday we had a 25 pounder come in i was three and a half miles offshore i'm a state water captain so i'm not going out to the federal waters yes it's true you can get some bigger fish out there but um, there are some big fish here too um, you just got to fish a lot and get lucky every once in a while so but they're out there so one of the biggest things um, that we use the most of is a basic Carolina rig so if you see here I've got a six ounce weight I did that to avoid some of the trigger fish because <laughs> um, I get by get down to the bottom <clears throat> But basically all this is, is a slip weight with a leader. So when your minnow slides up, if you use a cigar minnow or a pinfish or whatever, that allows that fish to swim and the fish don't feel the bite or the weight right away. Um, so you want to do it that way. <clears throat> now here's the key. <laughs> Boat control is essential. So when you're letting your line down, and you're letting your line down, as that line drops, if you feel your line gets slack, you're in 80 feet of water, 100 feet of water, it don't matter. But if you feel your line gets slack before you normally get to the bottom, that means a fish has picked up your bait. Okay, so I always, when I'm letting my lines down, I try to make sure that people keep their lines tight. Okay, put a little bit of pressure on it, let it fall, let it get down there as quick as you can, but as soon as you feel a fish, stop it. Because if you just continue to let it go, that fish is just going to take your bait and you're going to come up and you're going to be like, man, I'm not getting no bites, I'm not getting no bites. And then all of a sudden, you're going to reel up and you're not going to have no bait there. That's because he stole your bait on the way down. Um, here again, most of the guys that go out fishing, once they get the hang of it, and they do it a lot, and it's a little bit easier to get the concept of feeling that as you go down. So when I'm out fishing, and I sit there and I do it all the time, I want to keep constant pressure on that rod. And I watch my rod tip, and I've got real sensitive rods. I don't have big heavy duty rods. I, I mean, I can catch a 200 pound shark on this rod, okay? You just got to take your time doing it. But for snapper fishing, for any of the other type of bottom fishing that we do, this rod is perfect. You want a sensitive tip and you want to be able to feel that bite. So when you're backing up on the reef and you're down there, now, now we're safe, we got down the bottom. Get down the bottom, reel up a couple times, keep that line tight. But you want that line straight up and down like this. That's the boat captain's responsibility. Lines that are like this, you'll never feel the bites. Okay, and then plus they also get back behind the motors. So as that line is going back like this, that's telling you that you need to back the boat up. You need to back the boat up so that line gets to be where it's like this. You want that line as close to straight up and down and as tight as possible so you can feel the bites of the fish. So that's the responsibility. Now who's, who's all boat owners out here? Everybody's a boat owner. So guess who gets to not fish all the time? The guy driving that boat. <laughs> 
Um, so center councils, they make it a little bit easier as you're standing here. So in my boat, I've got a uh, 28 uh, foot ballistic uh, center council, this bigger than this, but basically I stand right here at the helm. I got my hand on the throttle, I got my hand on the steering wheel, and I watch these rod tips as everybody has them down. But the very first one, I drop down myself because I gotta know which way the current's going which way we're drifting, and so those lines stay straight. So everybody on my boat has the exact same ounce of weight on there. So if um, one person's on the bottom and his line looks like this, that means the other person whose line looks like this has let way too much line out. So they're gonna get their fish tangled up or whatever. So I just kind of constantly watch everybody's rods around the boat on both sides as I'm fishing to keep them as straight up and down as possible. And as you got them like this, <clears throat> this is what you're gonna do is when you feel your bite. So one of the biggest things a lot of people have a tendency to do, and how many freshwater fishermen we got out here? Okay, so we wanna do the bill dance. Ah, I got him, I'm trying to get that fish. With circle hooks, the way they're designed, you just wanna put constant pressure on that fish. There's no need to jerk, there's no need to raise the rod tip up. When I set my rod in my hand, this is it. I don't never leave this position. I don't got to go up here. I don't got to do nothing. I just constantly reel. Keep that pressure on. Your drag will pull that fish out. So if that fish is big enough to pull drag, he's going to pull drag. Just keep that rod. Keep the pressure on. Guys will try to reel down on them and yank up to try to get the hook set higher. And what happens if there's any slack, that circle hook backs right out and your fish is gone. And they're like, oh man, he got off. Well, the, the concept is, is I mean, I, I, I teach people this all the time when we're out in my boat and fishing with me is constant pressure. You want to just keep constant pressure on that fish and reeling him in. Don't stop. I mean, just keep reeling. I actually got shirts that have just reel on it. Just reel. This is all you got to do is just reel. Keep, let the rod and the line do everything else do the work. So, um, and like I said, now this is the Carolina rig. Um, and then he, this is something that I'll, I'll kind of look at today. So the very opening part of snapper season this year, um, the fish were on fire. I mean, it was absolutely on fire. It didn't matter what length the leader was. It didn't matter what, if it was short, if it was long. If, I mean, if you're using 20 pound, 30 pound or 40 pound, it didn't matter. They were biting it. But now up until today and yesterday, like the week in between that, I had to lower down my monofilament. I had to go to a fluorocarbon leader and I had to go down to about a 15 fluorocarbon leader with a lighter hook. This is the other thing that I see a lot of people sometimes. They'll go over and they feel like they gotta get a number five or a number six heavy duty hook. For red snapper, you don't need that. <laughs> Grouper fishing, amberjack, possible because you're talking about a bigger fish, a much more powerful fish, but for the majority of the red snapper that we catch here, you're gonna need just a light hook. But I had to downsize this hook to go to a light circle hook, just so that minnow was swimming around better and the red snapper would take it. Um, so there, there's things to try. If, you're, if you see the fish on your graph, I mean, we spend a lot of money um, on our boats and we spend a lot of money on our technology that we have, so rely on it. I mean, if you see fish down there, you just got to get them to bite. They're there. They're going to bite something. So you just got to figure out what it is. Um, for red snapper fishing, um, the majority of it that we do is going to be either cigar minnows or pinfish um, is what I like to use. I do cut strips of bonita up if I have a bonita that I've caught while I was trolling. And I make the bonita strips look like a minnow. So I, did, I cut them thin and long. The belly portion is my favorite. I love the belly portion of the bonita but I make it look like a minnow down there. So that way that snapper sees something that he's not used to seeing all the time. And sometimes the finicky fish can get him to bite that way. So um, <clears throat> other than that, uh, like I said, this is the basics of the Carolina rig. So let me show you another one. We will prepare. So now pretend that this swivel is a hook. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sure. So one about the weight. So if your boat, so I'm anchored with a uh, spot lock. Okay. Motor. So um, can I use the weight 
the, the weight of the sinker to keep the line Sure you can. If it's a really strong current though, you're probably going to go to have such a heavy weight. You, you, yeah. So it depends on the current on that one. Um, I don't hardly ever, ever anchor or use spot lock on my boat. Um, I like working the drift. Yep. And you mentioned earlier today about trigger fish. Today was a prime example. I pulled up on my spot and I, I, I promise you guys I was less than four miles offshore. I pulled up on the spot. The first lines that went down in the water, I caught like eight trigger fish, just boom, 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 boom. They were getting hit. I'm going through bait that I just got done spending $60 for. Because yeah. I buy my bait from the bait, man. I don't sabiki them up. I don't like wasting time. I want to get out and go fishing. So um, I was going through a bunch of bait. So I said, all right, guys, pull up. Stop for a second. I know you guys have fun catching these fish, but let's take a look at the rest of the reef. So I moved a little bit further south. So all of a sudden on my locator, I didn't see no more suspended fish. Trigger will feed all the way up to the top of the water column. Yes, sir. Yep. So, but when I moved to the south part of the reef, I didn't see nothing on top. Everything was on the bottom. Perfect. That's what I want to see. I want to see stuff that's anywhere from five to 15 feet off the bottom. Okay. And that's why some people, I tell them to reel up 10 times or reel up. 15 times. I want those baits off the bottom if I see those suspended fish in there. S snapper will come up also. One of the biggest snapper I've ever caught, I caught on a flat line. So there was no weight at all. That minnow was just out there swimming around. I was fishing for a cobia and the red snapper hit it. <laughs> you know, so um, they're not necessarily always on the bottom. But that's one way to do that, yes. But use a heavier weight, get that down there faster. Um, but then also make sure, you know, I mean, something like that, you wouldn't want that heavy weight for those fish to be feeling it. So you'd want to use a Carolina rig to do that. And, and or I'll, I'll show you a drop shot rig also in a second. Yeah, this is going to be simulated a knocker rig. So um, <laughs> when I first started fishing out here, and um, this was a, a very highly productive, common rig for people to use. So basically what you do is you just tie your hook on the end of your, your line, your monofilament here. Now if you're using braid, you're going to want to use a monofilament or a fluorocarbon drop shot or your leader line. So you have it away from the rod. You can use a uni to uni knot to tie that on there or some guys even put swivels on there just to stop it from twisting on the way up. But the drop shot rig has been around for a long time. I kind of went to more of the Carolina rigs just because of the people that I take out fishing a lot. It's the first time they've ever been out or don't do it that often. So this is an easier rig for them to feel the bite. But the drop shot rig is a very highly productive rig that basically gets the weight down faster. So if you imagine that minnow is on here and that weight is right there from him. So that's dropping a lot faster. So it's going to get by those trigger fish. Okay. It's going to get you down to the bottom. And now as soon as that hits the bottom, now guess what happens? That minnow swims up. So now you got your Carolina rig, but you really don't have a swivel in between it because that hook is this middle swimming around. And he'll swim around as much as your line as you let out. So he can let him off the bottom. Or if you pick up, the, if you pick, now if you pick this one up off the bottom, now you got the weight right next to the middle. And sometimes fish don't like that. So you, this one is more designed to hit the bottom, just come up a couple cranks and just leave it just like that. Let that fish swim be real close to the bottom. But that's the concept of a knocker rig. And usually when I'm fishing knocker rigs, if I'm in real deep water, um, I don't tend to use them. I use a Carolina rig. When I say real deep, I'm talking anything over 300 feet. Uh, most of our fishing that I do here is in less than 100 feet of water with my, with my clients and stuff. Um, as far as being into uh, um, the deep water, if you go out into the federal water and go out in the deep water, um, there, most of our fishing is done between 160 and 300 feet. I mean, not too many people go out further than that, but um, that concept, I would use a Carolina rig instead. Okay, now, it's so funny because some of the guys that I came, I'm fishing with this week, they've been fishing with me the six years that I've been doing it here, and uh, they always book me for five days of fishing, um, but they've gotten to purchase some of their own equipment. So, but one of the biggest mistakes, and even my friends that made this, because <laughs> they were with me here um, today fishing, um, they go buy these big heavy duty, let's just say 40 and 50 wides. Well, you guys know how heavy those are to hold? 
I mean, and you're holding those for snapper fishing. Those work great for trolling. They work great for big grouper. If you're out there on the bottom and you're going for a big grouper or a big amberjack or something, you know, you want that strength in that rod. But for red snapper fishing or trigger fishing or most of the reef fishing that we do in state waters, I swear to you, this is my favorite rod. <laughs> and this is all this is, it's a, it's a 20 wide. <laughs> I mean, I, I got 30 pound monofilament on here. Um, even my bigger rods, I have 40. These guys come out here, they got 80 pound monofilament on there. I'm like, are we going marlin fishing today? <laughs> I mean, it, I mean it's, it's really people tend to see to go overboard on what they're using. Um, a 20 pound red snapper, I could easily catch, easily catch on 30 pound line. He's not gonna break your line, he's not. Especially if you have your drag set right and you got your rod doing the work and you're not trying to horse him in and you're not yanking on him, he's not gonna break your line. Okay, now a grouper, that there, if he bites, you wanna make sure you can get him off the bottom. That's a tendency that grouper have is go back into their hole. So if you don't get him off the bottom, that's where a little bit stiffer rod comes into play because I can't just horse this one up. You know, I gotta make sure I get him you know, ready to come up. So, but for snapper fishing, um, this is one of my favorite outfits. It is a two speed reel. Um, here again, I don't need that, but people that have never fished before that catch a bigger fish, two speed reel is just you click in the second speed and it's like a granny gear in your vehicle. It just helps you horse that fish up. It'll get him up coming up a lot easier. So any, any questions on the Carolina or the knocker rig style? Anybody guys know you guys welcome. <laughs> I'm Dave, by the way. Um, we're, we're, mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, I do it all the time. <laughs> um, so another trick that I don't do, that I know a lot of the charter boat captains do, is they put salt on their bonita. It makes the skin tougher. It makes everything last a little bit longer and go through the bites. Um, so you get Epsom salt and just spray it on there, or just sprinkle it on there, let it dry, then freeze it. And then once you put it in the water, I mean, it's, it's like leather trying to get it on there. So it's the same way for the fish to pull it off. It's hard to do. So anybody ever try to get Benita skin off their hook after it's been, all the meat's gone? It's like impossible. So get scissors to do that. But yep, that's true. She brines some Ben Hayden. Oh, okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's putting salt on stuff. It's amazing. Okay, so now we're going to talk about You've heard these called chicken rigs or drop shot rigs. Um, we use these primarily for fishing for mingo or smaller fish, porgies and stuff like that there, but they're a multiple hook rig. I got two on this one. You can run three, you can run one. On my spinning reels, here again, this is only a 4,500 spinning reel. Um, it's light. I got 30 pound braid on here. Um, let me show those hooks apart. But basically, that's what it looks like. So it's like a job shot rig, except the hooks are a little bit further away from the line. Um, and we use this tipped with squid or a small piece of bonita. Um, but this is what we catch, the mingos, the porgies, the smaller reef fish. I had a Gatsby grouper get one today. Um, you know, so, and I mean, I don't know if you, people call them strawberry groupers, but they're only about this big and um, they're, they're really good to eat and they're, they're small and you catch them a lot. So, but um, that's what this rig looks like. Um, this, this right here is not. No, nope. on mine, for most of mine, I don't do that because it goes, fluorocarbon is very expensive. When I go out fishing by myself, yes sir, fluorocarbon all the time. But I know what I'm doing, so I, I mean, I'm out there with it. And I, you don't know how many rigs I lose down the bottom. People are like, oh, man, I, I can't get it. Well, we're only fishing in 80 feet of water. How far down do you think that is? And I mean, most of my guys, they'll have line way back there and they'll get them stuck on the rig, so I end up breaking them off. So that's why I just use, I use regular monofilament. This is Andy line, um, tie them up. And I'm not very good at tying these. Matter of fact, I have a buddy that ties them up for me because I just, I, but that's the concept to them. This one here is 40. 40. Yep. Okay, yep. Correct. Yep. Is that double? Do you double it? Do you leave it double or do you, do you cut it? When you, with your hook there, so you can change your hooks? Okay. Well, yeah. I leave it just like this, but I'm going to show you this. Yeah. So, really, all this is, yep. 
See how I took that hook off? Yeah. So this is a loop in here. Yeah. So let's just say I'm catching trigger fish and I'm after fr trigger fish now. They're in season. I want to catch trigger fish. Well, I can't be using me a red snapper hook that's this big. Their mouths are really little. So go to a smaller hook. I use a one ot for trigger fish. Now, yes, I go to a heavier circle hook then. Okay, but it's a one ot. It's still small. But the reason I don't use the wire ones like this here, because guys, big trigger fish will bite right through this. <laughs> the next thing you know, your hook is broke and bent right off. Yep. Yeah. So, um, but this is a, a, a normal, this is a two aught right here. It's a smaller one, but this is a light circle uh, used for mingles and stuff like that there. But if you had to change your hook size up, that's why I leave these like this. Because it's real easy for me to do that. And basically all you do is you spread your line apart. I can't use the same spot, but. What's the name of that rig? Well, we, it's basically a drop shot rig, but we call them chicken rigs around here. <laughs> yeah, um, or mingo rigs, um, different things. But if you pinch it together, and then you just come through the eyelet like that, then you just cut right around your hook. There, in, in seconds, I just changed my hook. So I changed from bigger size to a smaller size. What kind of knot do you use? Oh, well, here again, this is a rig that, I, I, I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's actually in my phone there. Jesse, where are they at? There, there's, there's What's the name of the knot? YouTube. Uh, YouTube. Okay. I'll show them how to drop a shot. A drop, yeah, yeah, it's, but, it's, but it's a twist. Yeah, you twist it. And then you pull it through and. Yeah. 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 When you get to be as old as me, then I, I don't do them no more because I can't see it to do it. So I don't even try because next thing I know, it's a slip knot. Oof, there it goes. <laughs> no, it don't. As long as you get it through there and then you come back around it, but make sure it senses down on it. Because if not, your hook can come right off too. Make sure it'll stay tight. After you've noticed how that one was kind of formed in there because it's been caught, have a couple fish on it. Um, same way with this one. I mean, it's set in there. It's, it takes a little bit of pressure for me to get it to come out. So um, that's just because it's on there. And then I do the same concept down here with the weight. Okay, so the weight. Is the same way. It's got a knot down here. Now this one just basically an overhand knot double tied and then you make a loop. Okay, so you got your loop right there. I make mine usually a little bit bigger, but um, that way, if it's a lot of current, if there's a lot of waves, you can switch from a four ounce to a six ounce to an eight ounce in a matter of seconds. You don't gotta retie the whole rig up to do it. You can just use that to get down there. <clears throat> Here again, I'm talking state water. 90% of my fishing that I use is anywhere between a four or six ounce weight. On days like trying to think of what was the day was rougher Saturday when we were out there I mean it was almost impossible to feel the bite because it was really choppy the current was a southwest flow and it was cooking so you I had to actually switch to an eight ounce weight so my guys would feel their fish get down or bake it down to the bottom because if not they weren't doing it but normally time between four and six ounces up to 100 feet of water you're good to go and I've dropped down to two ounces before if it's calm out there and there's not much current, I mean, heck, have fun with it. Let the, let the fish get down there and you don't gotta, you know, feel that weight on there all the time and you can catch some good fish with it. And, um, but it just makes it easy to change. And like I said, sometimes these rigs will have three, three of them on there also. But this is basically the drop shot, chicken rig, whatever you wanna call it, we use for our smaller reef fish. Now I'm gonna show you a three way, which is very common to use for red snapper. <laughs> Whilst it is, is a little bit bigger version of what we have right here. So, matter of fact, this rod still has an eight ounce on it. Now this is a 5,000 size spinning reel, medium heavy action rod, but if you notice it's still a small hook because our snapper were being really finicky on Sunday and I had to use a lighter hook. This is a three-way swivel. So basically the same concept, but here it allows me to adjust the leader line to as long or as short as I want it. So I tightened up these because the guys were wanting, the fish were getting up too high. 
So I made them a little bit shorter. Now this one's exceptionally short just for demonstration purposes, but normally two to three feet long is all you need on there. And here again, this works, the same concept. So when you hit the bottom, you reel up a couple times and that middle will be swimming. Now he's, he's right now at least a foot off the bottom and he's swimming up. If I got a three foot leader, he'll be swimming up a little bit to get away from the fish down there. So that's where you can adjust the size of your leader. I use a good um, three-way swivel. Um, it, it, it don't have to necessarily be a ball bearing swivel, but just a good three-way swivel. Um, these are 80 pound swivels. Um, so they'll take the twist and everything else. And that's the other thing with the Carolina rig, like I showed you earlier, a lot of people tend to reel those up too fast when you don't have fish on there. And then you get all that line twist. Okay, this will eliminate that. <laughs> you won't have that because you got a good um, swivel on there and this, the minnow is spinning or whatever that will do that. So just stay that concept. Here again, with this here, it's a loop knot to where basically I could change the weight. I can do from a four to a six to an eight ounce without having to change my whole rig. I have these set up um, for my snapper fishing and um, for people that not familiar with a traditional level wind um, that get backlash too often, spinning reels, nothing to worry about. Open up the bale, drop them down there, and you don't got to worry about your line getting twisted or caught up on anything. It's just basically um, going to hit the bottom and then here again, as soon as, I, bet, I don't want to mark up Sean's floor, um, as soon as you feel your line stop like that, then close that bale, tighten up your line, because you're going to get a bite right away. If you're on top of fish, you will get a bite as soon as you get down to the bottom. And if you don't, they've already got your bait. You just got to trust me on that one. <laughs> Go ahead. Do you, uh, when you take your clients out, do you, uh, they just drop the line straight down from the boat or you cast them out? Or oh, no, no. Drop them straight down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm glad I'm not a bay fisherman because I would hate to be out casting with some of my people that are in my boat. <laughs> but um, no, you want to just drop your, your, when you're fishing on that reef and you're out there, um, and here again, if you're the captain of the boat and you're driving your boat and you've got your family out fishing, um, make it easy for them. You know, you want them to just drop it straight down. Don't, don't worry about pitching it up this way if the current's going back this way, just drop it. I can back the boat up. My friends that are here with me right now, I mean, this is, I never leave this position. This is it, unless I'm taking off a fish. And at that time, I'm hurrying up, I'm either going to this side or I'm going to this side. Hey, throw that one in the box, or hey, this one's too small. And I mean, but I, this is it, because the whole time that I'm doing this, I'm watching everybody's line. Now, you want to get into a confusing point? Have a four ounce on there, have an eight ounce on there, and then have a, a guy wants to use an ultralight and go at two ounce. <laughs> I mean, then it's like, it's a disaster because now everybody's lines are not dropping at the same pace. But if everybody uses the exact same size weight, and, as, and I say that, okay, so here you go. This is a little secret. 30 pound braid. It's got about the diameter of a 10 or a 12 pound monofilament. Okay, so this is going to drop faster than what my 30 pound monofilament's going to. So if I'm using a six ounce weight on my monofilament, I might only need a four ounce weight on this. See what I'm saying? Because it drops faster, because monofilament has a buoyancy in the water where the braid don't. This gets down there. So, uh, uh, sir, you were talking about the trigger fish. Here again, braid drops faster. So, I mean, in, I mean, I love using spinning reels because it's easy to handle, they're lighter, um, and I, I crank down on them pretty good. So, um, braid will come into use during that. But I don't use braid on my level lines. Some captains do, but I don't. <laughs> um, strictly because you get a backlash in a braid, good luck trying to get it out. <laughs> I'm on a filament, I can still get them out pretty good, but they don't happen on, on, on um, braid on a level line. So this rig, like I said, is, is basically a three-way swivel rig. Um, here again, you can adjust your leader length. You can put your hook on there. Um, and here again, if I wanted to switch sizes of hooks on this, <laughs> In my off season, if I'm bored at home, I will tie snails, okay? But most of mine is just a regular improved clinch knot, a trialing knot on there and that's it. Get them tied, get them down there, and catch a fish. That's the main thing. Um, they can make all look pretty store-bought snails as you want, but it really isn't gonna do anything to help you catch any more fish. I mean, this is easy, it's an easy quick rig for me to tie, 
put it on there, get it on, and get, get going. All right. Now we're going to talk about our last bottom fishing portion. Yeah, I'll get that in a second. All right. One of my favorite things to fish with, the jig. <laughs> there are all different types of jigs. You get blade jigs, you get them thin, you get them thick, you get them heavy, you get them light. But I love, and once you do this, you'll get stuck on jig fishing. Now, will I catch as many fish as live bait? Not necessarily, but I could catch as big as fish as they're catching um, because the aggressive fish will go after this. If they're aggressive, they're gonna go after this. So while all those little fish are over there fighting for those little baits and stuff that they see down there, all of a sudden a bigger fish sees this big thing going all over the place. There's two different ways to work a blade jig. Amberjack fishing, who's got any amberjack fishermen out here? Too much work. It is. <laughs> It's a lot of work. But hey, if you want some aerobic time and... Right? Hey, I caught, I caught over 20 amberjack this year and I didn't have one legal keeper. So, um, where last year was pretty good. This year it has not been a good, was not a good amberjack. Now you know it'll come back on after snapper season again, so... This was just twisted around this line here, so I'm getting it around here. Okay, all right. There we go. Oh, God dang it, there's still this twisted there. Remember those eyes I was telling you about when you get older? And I'm sorry, I did tell you guys a little bit of a fib. I've been doing this for 45 years, not 35. I'll be 59 this year, and I started when I was 14 as a deckhand. <laughs> so, Here? all over. Um, my actual, I had two uncles. My dad wasn't a fisherman, but I was. I loved it. Uh, one of my uncles was a charter boat captain on Lake Erie. And um, when I was young, I started there by cleaning fish and everything. And then my other uncle lived out of Swansboro, North Carolina, so we fished the Atlantic a lot. So in the summertime, I go down there to, because I wanted to be around the big boats. Man, I wanted to go where big fish are. I didn't care about those walleye and those perch, but I wanted to catch those. So um, yeah, and then I've, I've fished all over the world. I mean, I've fished out of San Diego. I've fished out of Honolulu. Um, I was in a boat in the Whipshaw over there, and, and Honolulu is, or I'm sorry, San Diego is the vagabond. Um, you know, so it's, uh, it's fun. I mean, I've been as far as Guadalupe, Mexico, been on the water for 10 days, yellowfin, tuna fishing, not seeing land for 10 days and catching them on these things right here on jigs or something like this. But so anyhow, so who said about jig fishing being a lot of work? That was you, right? Okay. So Amberjack, they love jigs, but you gotta be very aggressive. And I'm gonna open up the bail because I really don't wanna hit nobody. So, but when you see me, when I'm out amber jig, you gotta pretend this line's tight. So here you go. When I'm out on the boat and I got people that I know with, you can cast this jig out. Cast it and you just let it sink for a little bit. And I'm gonna come up here because I don't wanna hit that canopy. My buddy's rod, he'll kill me. So, um, but let's just say I casted this way out that way. And now I'm letting it sink, I'm letting it sink, I'm letting it sink because I'm in 160 feet of water. And I'm like, okay, now I want to work the whole water column. I'm just like this, wham, 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 wham. And I'm reeling at the same time. I'm reeling down at the same time because I'm bringing that jig into me, all right? And then next thing you know, that rod goes vroom, and that amber jack's on. So let's just say you go, you're 160 feet and you're wham, wham, wham. And then all of a sudden, you don't get a bite. Guess what? Do it again. So it's a good aerobic workout. You will get a workout, especially when it's 100 degrees out there. Um, so that is a, a, a lot of fun fishing. You will catch amberjack doing that. You will catch almaco jack doing that. You will catch blackfin tuna doing that. They love it fast and erratic. So as more erratic you get, 
the better it's going to be. Um, and I just trust me, I was, I, when I first started jig fishing, I was used to jig fishing on the bottom for grouper, for snapper. Um, sometimes an amberjack will hit it down there too. Um, but the suspended fish, when you have your locator and you're out there drifting that reef and you see big marks in 40, let's just say 40 feet to 80 feet of water and you're in 160, my gosh, those are either Almaco Jack, Amberjack, or Blackfin Tuna. Fish them. I mean, you're going you're gonna to have a blast. You know, so um, in uh, this one here, this color, it's a good color, and you can see all the marks on it and stuff, but my favorite one is the pink and white. <laughs> the pink and white is my favorite jig. <laughs> um, and I have them in my boat, and I just constantly use them all the time. Now, the way we got this one rigged up is with the swivel. Um, here again, it's easy to tie. Got um, either 40 or 35-pound um, braid on here. Um, you can even go 50-pound braid if you wanted to. But here again, you got a little bit stronger of a mono. And this one here, um, you want to lose a little bit stronger. So like 60 or 80 because of the shock of that. So with braid fishing line, guess what? There's no give. There's no give at all. So when that amberjack would just all of a sudden smash that jig, if I had it tied to directly to this braid, you better have your drag set really light or he's gonna bust your rod or he's gonna bust your line and he's gonna just do it, he's gonna snap it. So you want some bit of a leader on there to give it a little bit of shock. And that's what we use that for. And here again, you could use a swivel or you could do a uni to uni knot and you have it all one piece. Have you, uh, you put bait on the end of that? No, sir. Like yes, sir. Yep, you want this thing just like I said, as radical as can be. Um, now that's for amberjack and any of those fish I mentioned up above. So now let's talk about snapper fishing or grouper fishing with a jig. So this is, like I said, a blade jig, but there are also some roundhead jigs that you can get. And those there, the roundhead jigs, you can tip those with a piece of uh, bonito or something, or a, even artificial plastic or something down there. You could do that with those. My blade jigs, this is the way they are. Nothing but this, because this is, looks like I mean, if you can imagine, this is my hands, the jig, it's, it's doing this. That's what it's doing. As it's dropping, it's doing that. And especially the more I drop it, because that's, that's the other thing. You don't care about this one, what I told you about keeping your line tight. This one here, you want it to go all different directions. Because trust me, once that fish hits it, usually they hit it on the drop. So if I jig up, and when I, when I start reeling down, he's going to chase it, and he's going to grab it. And, and then that's when I'm going to feel him, because he's going to grab this pole, and he's just going to... Um, Definitely let me know he's there. So, oh, go ahead. I'm not going to have any smart questions like these guys. Oh, no. My questions are going to be stupid. So, there is so no what, such thing. I was in the military for 24 years. There's no such thing. I know that's true. <laughs> when I ask him, you say, that's a really stupid question. All right, so, so you're talking about pulling it back and forth. Is it supposed to simulate a real fish? Absolutely. Thing? So yep. in the water, there are fish that, that swim like that? Nope. What happens is yeah. wounded fish yeah. will swim like that. So as those fish are out there, they're eating bait fish. So as you see bait busting on top of the water, they're being chased up by something. Okay, because normal fish won't come up to the top of the water unless they're being schooled up. Now, either that could be dolphins, that could be amberjack, it could be tuna, it could be anything. But they're going to chase those bait fish up. So when those fish are coming up through that bait and they're getting one or two here, they're hitting lots of them. So the other ones are just fluttering down, doing this, maybe trying to stay alive, or, but that's what that represents. Okay. So it represents a wounded bait fish. So something that they're gonna see um, that they would wanna eat. Um, and like I said, with those fish that I mentioned there, you can never get too erratic on those. I mean, you can just go nuts with it. But like, like the gentleman was saying in the back, you're done after about three or four casts because you, you got to take a break and go to the bottom and have a cold refreshment and sit down there and wait for them to get ready to go again. But when we're on the bottom fishing, <clears throat> so you go all the way down. Now everybody else in the boat is using five or six ounce weights or eight ounce weights, and you're using the six ounce jig. So now I'm down there. So now this action right here could be as subtle, and please pretend this line's tight, as just this. Just doing this right here. And you're not reeling, you're just sitting there jigging. Sitting there jigging. Now you're, let's just say you're only coming up four or five feet off the bottom, right? No bites, no bites, all right? Reel up a little bit. So now I reeled it up a little bit, so I come up another 10 feet. Stop again, and sit there and jig. And it's pretty soon you're just gonna feel wham, 
and then you're going to know it. And trust me, when they hit these jigs, you, they're on. Very seldom will you lose a fish from a jig. If you did, you lost him, it's because you accidentally snagged him or he wasn't completely hooked or didn't engulf it. You got the bottom of him, he made a swipe at it, and you got a portion of him. You felt it for a second. But most of the time they hit that, that's going to be spot on as far as catching that fish. So, jig fishing. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I, so, I broke out the jig for the first time to try to get past the triggers, mm -hmm. and we actually got a hit on it, but the hook location on the jig. Does that make a difference? Because mine were brand, brand new out of the package. Yep. And they were on the back. They were on the back? Yeah, on the, on the bottom. On the bottom. Okay, so if you notice on these jigs, <clears throat> my buddy Eric here, he likes to make sure he gets his fish hooked. So. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so on these ones, these jigs here, if you notice where that long part is right here, yeah. okay, that usually is the double one. So you want to put it up here, okay? So you have your double. I don't have my double rig setting down below, okay? So now if, let's just say this was the opposite. Let's just say there was a jig that you get that's got two of these right here, the same size, the same swivel, right? Yeah, that's way okay, so that's the way yours is. Yeah. All right, so I would tie it up here the double and there would be no hook here, okay. all right? All right, so now if it's designed, like this jig is designed to be tied on right here. Okay, so if, if these hooks weren't here, and I always have spares of these, because you usually get them in the package with it, um, so you can just put them on. If you notice, that's just a regular loop knot in there. You just do the same concept. You just put them through there, push it back through, and you got it on there. Because um, you'll get these busted off. I mean, especially when you get to like... Uh, uh, I've had kings eat, eat these, um, but even some of the trigger um, grouper, any toothy fish will fray that. So keep an eye on that because you will lose them. But now with three of them on there, yeah, I mean, one of them is going to be good, <laughs> you know. So, um, but like you can tell that this one right here is different. So it's not the same. So this was probably a new one that we put on here just to help with the jigging. That's called a six ounce. Blade well, this one here, I'm not for sure which, this is a 120 gram, which I think is about that size weight. Yep. Yes. So, um, but you can get them up to, I mean, I've got 210 gram. I mean, I've got some big ones because when I go out deep water fishing, I love fishing with these. Uh, one of my favorite times to fish over here is in December. Um, it's a slow time of the year. Nobody's out fishing. I don't got any customers. My buddy Brian will come down. We'll take his big black fin out and we'll go out and go 60 miles offshore and we'll jig all day long. We'll jig and troll. We'll just, that's all we do. Um, and just to catch fish. And here again, when you, when you do um, aggressive fishing, um, if you're fishing baits like this, um, look for things, just like you do when you're trolling. If you see birds flying and busting on the water and baits coming up, I mean, that's a perfect time to throw a jig. Because <laughs> like I said, something's chasing those fish up. So um, with the exception of flying fish, but, because they fly around out there all the time, but those, um, uh, those other big bait schools, when you see that, that's a very great opportunity to pitch something like a jig. You can get that down there, and, and it's, it's, it's good casting. I mean, there's, I can cast this thing almost a mile. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, you get out there, you got a good rod, and here again, I mean, um, I don't even know for sure which brand this is, but um, it's a Florida Osprey fishing reel. It's one of our, it's, a, it's just real light, and I'll let you guys all feel this stuff. You can feel it. One of my reels that I have, I have a Daiwa set up, but it's a lot heavier. So if I'm using that big reel for jigging, it makes me more worn out. I mean, you talk, just come feel this rod once. And this rod has lots of backbone. I mean, it, it, trust me, it can catch some big fish. I mean, what was that shark? Probably 200 pounds plus. I mean, it was a good one. And he brought it right in with this rod. This rig, I got it right in my hand. You know, so, um, I mean, it, it definitely can be done. So. Um, here again, I mean, one of the biggest things that people make the mistake on, um, I love fighting a fish. Okay, so you put a broomstick in my hand and attach a big enough reel to it, of course I'm going to get the fish in, but it's not going to be no fun for me because I'm just going to wrench him in. But you get the right equipment, and it's a blast. This is what gets you addicted right here. And when you catch a 40-pound amberjack on this or, you know, or a blackfin tuna on this, and I mean... I mean, you're sitting there in that line screaming like you got a blue marlin on there. I mean, that's a blast. That's what it's all about. I mean, heck, even catch a bonita on this. It's a great time. 
you know, so um, this it's just different concepts of getting down there and um, doing more fishing. You know, a lot of people, when they talk to me, they always want to, they're like, man, Dave, you're always catching the big ones. No, you know what? I'm not. You just see that because I fish so often. I mean, when I go, most of the guys that I go out with, you fish two or three times a month and you think that's a lot. Well, I fish 27 days in a row, you know, and I mean, I'm out there every day. So, and I mean, you're going to have good days and bad days um, when it comes to fishing. Um, like I said about the, the snapper bite uh, last weekend, it was really tough for me. I mean, one of my charters I brought in, I only had like three red snapper that they could keep. We caught others, we caught lots of fish, but they only got to keep them. It was just a lighter bite. It was a real sensitive bite. I got smaller hooks, I got lighter fluorocarbon on there, and I started catching some better fish. So always kind of play around with that. But the more you get out there, the more experience you get, you're gonna know to do these things and kind of keep up with it. Okay, um, it's a good question. We had a school of mahi come up on my boat the other day. Um, and he, here again, it's different things if I have it set up or not. So I've always got two really light rods in my, next to my captain's helm. It's in my rod holders there on the side of my boat. I got one with a bare hook on it. It's got nothing but a hook. And then the other one's got like a mural lure or something on it or a spoon something that's got flash because if you see those fish you all of a sudden you run up on a grass pool and you want to let's just say if that boat over there is my grass line okay so i got my buddy and if he, if he knows what he's doing i could trust him and i'll drive the boat but you want to go in there really slow because if you want you get her stand up as high as you can and you're looking down and you're trying to see if you see the fish swimming around down there now once you see them you got to back it off and then get ready to fish so get the rod set that you need to get rod set up. But one of my favorite rigs that I have is a really light spinning reel. Um, it's actually a lot lighter than this one, um, but it's right down by me. I use it for red fishing um, or sometimes even sabiki rigs, but it's a real light rod. Um, but I have that hook on there. Tip it with a piece of squid. But once you get, and you see those mahi out there, you toss it out there and trust me, if they're feeding, he's gonna hit that right away. Soon as you get that mahi on, leave that fish on your line in the water to get the other fish feeding with him. And at that time, I'm throwing out pieces of squid. I'm getting them all fired up. So that way everybody can get their rods in the water with a piece of squid on it, and then they'll all catch a mahi. So when you see that, or like I said, if you want to cast a spoon, you could do it. But the key is, is keep it in the water. Um, so that way it gets all the rest of the school fired up. Um, I've casted just about everything at Mahi's. I mean, I've had one of them hit a flat line with a, with a cigar minnow this big, and I think the Mahi was only that big. You know, I was like, what are you planning on doing with that fish? But it, they're very aggressive fish. Uh, Mahi are the fastest growing fish in the ocean. So they grow in size and numbers. They're in their blast to catch. They jump out of the water. I mean, they're, they're fun. And if you're again using, the most of the ones that we catch, I think I've only caught in, Oh, probably four or five bulls since I've been here. Now, I catch a lot of them over in Hawaii. I've caught a lot of them out of San Diego, a lot of them out of North Carolina, big bulls. I'm talking 40 inches plus, okay? But um, most of the ones we call or catch around here are the smaller mahi. I mean, they're a school mahi. Um, but they'll relate to those grass lines or anything floating in the water. And, you know, we talk about stuff floating in the water. I have caught 50 mahi off of a cooler lid. Okay, so if it's floating in the water, it's not supposed to be there. But fish relate to structure. Something's going to do it. That, that thing could have moss growing on it, seaweed hanging from it, barnacles growing on it, whatever. But that's going to caught, get the little tiny bait fish in there. And when that does, it's going to bring the other fish in. So mahi love that kind of stuff. And along with triple tail and everything else, there's so, many, so much wildlife under grass lines. Now, we had a really big grass line. It wasn't even 12 miles out. Um, it's starting to break up now, and I've even seen it in as close as three or four miles out now. But it's not, it's patchy now. It's not a big, long, you could follow grass lines for miles <laughs> if it's a big one. You could troll them up and down it. Um, that's going to be next month's seminar, so I don't want to get too much into that. Um, but um, 
working that grass line with just about any type of lure um, that's going to cause some flash and work it fast here again because mahi are fast they want to chase it so um, but you can you can get into them and our water temperature is finally getting up there so did you say what you do with the rod that has just the hook on it you said you have two rods i got one with the hook and one with the spoon and then but you're giving the example of what you do with the one with the spoon right what about the one with the hook i just put a piece of squid on there just a small piece of squid and just toss it out there because i mean that that rod's so light it's got 15 pound um braid on it and i can just toss that out there that one i do have a little bit of a fluorocarbon leader tied to it because i do fish for redfish with it once in a while um and i can just toss it out there and I mean, it, it's a blast. You can watch them come up and hit it. I mean, it really is. Any weight on that rig? What, weight? No weight. Nope. No weight. Just use the weight of the squid to toss it out there. Because they're really only for me to that boat away. So it's simple toss and then you bring them in. And, and, and then speaking of bottom fishing, um, which this is supposed to be all about, I mean, when you're out there, be always looking around your boat. Because, I mean, just the other day I was out, we were having a tough time with our snapper. But next thing I know, I look down and the guy's like, Man, there's a shark. Well, it could be a cobia, it could be a remora, because um, they really don't know the difference between the two. But there's fish constantly swimming around your boat. So be on lookout. Well, this time we saw it. He's like, Dave, man, there's a blue fish down there. And we had mahi swimming right around the boat. So if I didn't have that rod already timed up, but tied by would have got that bait in there, that mahi would have been gone. You know, but I had her tied up, so I hurried up, put a piece of squid on there, dipped over the side of the boat, and this little boy ended up catching a mahi about this big. You know, so, um, you know, and it was on ultralight. So, I mean, he's zzz, and the fish is jumping up in the air. And I mean, he's, he had a blast with it. But be always be watching around your boat. And speaking of which, Cobia. Um, we caught our first one, was it last week or the week before? Sunday. Two Sundays ago. Um, but it was a big Cobia. I mean, we're, it was one of the biggest ones I had. And uh, we caught it. Uh, we were fishing on the bottom, coming up, and the Cobia hit it. Okay, but there will be around your boat. So when somebody says, oh my gosh, there's a shark, it might necessarily, I've only had a couple sharks swim around my boat, but most of the time it's either a remora or a cobia. So be on the lookout for that when you're fishing around reefs. What do you throw at cobia? Okay, there I've got an eel. I didn't bring that with me, um, but it's a, it's a fake eel. They make them, it's a lure about this long. It's got a treble hook in the front, and treble hook in the back. Um, and that, it's just because I don't buy live eels every time I go out there. And they also make cobia jigs. And here again on the cobia jig, I like the pink and white with the pink twister tail off the back. So I'll either have one of those rods set up, especially during the springtime of the year. Uh, maybe not so much in the fall. Most of my cobia that I catch in the fall is going to come off of live bait and usually when I'm bottom fishing. So it's, uh, the, I'm either bringing up my bait, checking it, and then they hit it, or they're down there swimming around closer to the bottom. Um, when you're bottom fishing, a lot of the cobia that you're going to catch is going to be juveniles. Okay, they're not going to be as big. Um, the bigger cobia will tend to swim towards, okay, here's another great one. Oh my God, look at that, Captain Dave. There's a sea turtle over there. Oh yeah, let's go over there by him because there's going to be fish swimming around him. I mean, if that sea turtle's this big, he's bigger than a cooler lid, you know, so he's going to have some fish swimming around him. Always investigate anything you see out in the water. It could be... If it's a beach ball, I'm not really going to be too concerned about it, okay? Because it's not have enough stuff underwater. It's just floating on top. But if you see something, investigate it. I mean, like I said, you'd be surprised what you'll find on a piece of wood or a small piece of grass. I mean, I caught one of the biggest triple tails I ever had. Um, I think it was, I don't know if it was an old bucket, a five-gallon bucket, but somehow this thing was floating and that triple tail was hanging right off of it. And I threw a cigar minnow out there on him on a flat line, which is going to be my final rod and reel combo. So I might as well talk about that. That's a good leeway, right? Um, I took that out there and I threw the flat line out. And here again, this is a line that we have. If you notice the line on here, the hook, much heavier. All right, because if I'm going to catch a cobia or an amberjack on a flat line, you're going to want something with a little more stout. <laughs> because you don't want them to bend that hook. There's nothing more frustrating for me, and it'll be the same for you, trust me, when I come up and I get, lose a fish and I see that hook bent out like this. That's my fault. That's my fault, because that person was put on a big fish and I didn't have the right equipment on there and that straightened out that hook. So when you are fishing for big fish, um, now if a big fish bites a small hook, 
There ain't nothing you can do about that. But when you're fishing for big fish, use the right equipment. So uh, when I have my flat line set up, this is all it is. You could, this has 65 pound braid on it. And if I see a bunch of high marks, and let's just say the boat's drifting this way, but the current's really not going much. Let's just say everybody's fishing almost straight up and down. And I'm not having to back up my boat. I'm not having to turn it a little bit. It's almost perfect. Those days don't happen too often, but they do. Something like that, I would come up to the bow of my boat, put a live bait on here, pinfish, grunts, cigar minnows, mackerel, herring, any of it. Any of it works. Okay, take this, throw it out as far as you can, and just let it set. Let it swim down a little bit, close the bale. Set the drag really light. You want to be able to pull that out. This one's actually a little bit lighter. So you want it to be more like this. So that way he'll rip that line out when he gets a bite. And then what you do is as soon as you pick up the rod, get ready to fight it, just turn your drag a little bit and get ready for the fight position. So as soon as you get that on there, because he's already hooked, because that line's already going and set on there. <clears throat> but you will catch just about any type of fish on the flat line. So one of the biggest red snapper I've ever caught out here was on a flat line. I thought I was seeing cobia. I thought I was seeing amberjack or something that was up that high. They were only like 20 feet down, but there was a bunch of them. And I threw this out there. And next thing I know, I had a big old red snapper. So who's ever caught a 25 pound red snapper? What do you recommend for the average weekend fisherman who has a boat and likes to go out and fish as far as you're talking about several different rods and reels and lines and what do you think the average person like take with? Okay. So, what do you like to fish with? Pardon? What do you like to fish with? Do you like to fish with a conventional reel? Or are you spinning? Spinning, okay. So then I would get me a heavy, like this is a 6500 series. Okay, so this is a 6500 series spinning. So this would be what I would use for my flat line. But if I wanted one for, let's just say you want two rods that you want as your favorite rods. So then I would take the five, oops, don't tell Sean I did that to his boat. I take the 5000 series with a heavy, this is a heavy action rod, so it's got backbone to it. So with this rod right here, I could fish for snapper, grouper, or anything else with it. Okay? Um, and then like this one here, you'd have for your flat line. Or uh, it's like, so, so for me, when I go out, um, I usually pick three rods because I do like fishing a conventional. I like that just because I'm good with feeling the fish. Here, you, you can hold your hand on here to feel a little bit of bite, but on that, on that conventional reel, <clears throat> I always have my hand just like this so I could feel that bite. So I, if I was to pick three rods, it would be just like this right here. And what size reel is that? Which, which one? The one the this one? This is, a, I believe this is a 20 series, but it's... Um, it's only rated for up to 40 pound mono is the most you can put on here. I got 30 on here right now. So it's a smaller one. This is Saltiga. I mean, my reels get beat up. They get used so much. Um, this is reels only a year old, but um, it gets used pretty much. So, um, I mean, and this one's a two speed. Like I said, it's got that little bit of a granny gear in there. It just helps people with, that never caught big fish before to help them reel it in, puts it into a lower gear. Um, now, Next month, we'll get into trolling. And then on those, that's where it gets expensive. <laughs> um, I mean, because they're, now you're talking different styles of reels, um, different sizes. Um, Try not to make a mark on this boat there. But, um, every, really oh. Fast. We have the schedule for the next dates. Oh, okay. For the seminars and just information for signing up for those and other events on yeah. the website. Whenever you guys. Um, I couldn't remember. Is it next month electronics or trolling? Next month, I think. I'm not sure. Okay, well, we'll figure that out. We'll get it's that information. Website, yeah. Printable calendar. Uh, yeah. All the events on there. So, so to answer your question, getting back, if if I was just going out, let's just say Dave's finally done with charter fishing and I can't take it no more of the, I just want to go out and have fun. I would probably get me a 6,500 spinning, a 5,000 spinning, 
and a nice conventional reel and that's it. And I can do almost every type of fishing that I'm going to do out here with that, with the exception of trolling. Trolling, now you're talking some major equipment. And then, um, and for example, on the, all these here, I, I know the, our, the jigging rod that my buddy Eric has there, um, I mean, you might get into a you know, $300 combo there, but most of mine here, um, these here are, are about only 150 bucks. <laughs> and that's for the rod and reel combo. You know, so it's, 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 a, it's a Daiwa reel. Um, it's almost like a pen senator, or a, I'm sorry, a pen pen fisher. Um, um, is real. Okay. Yeah, that's a great reel. Okay. Yeah. Per perfect size. I mean, that's what this one is, the 45. My, this one's a 5,000, um, but this one's a 45. But I mean, I, I can get, I've caught a big shark on a 45 before. So, I mean, you can do it. Um, you just got to take your time with it. And then like this reel here, got to get that weight off of there. Um, this reel right here, I mean, I think this whole combo right here was like maybe $180, you know, so you just don't have to worry about uh, um, spending a lot of money unless you really want to. Now, of course, I mean, you can get into some very expensive pins, Shimano, Daiwa even makes uh, very expensive reels. Um, but there again, I mean, you're paying for the ball bearings, you're paying for the confinement of everything and the sealing of the salt water keeping it out of there um, and salt water speaking of which all your rod and reels make sure you fresh water rinse those every time you come in um, I mean take the time to do it if you don't wash the boat well that's not a good thing either but wash the rod and reels for sure because if you don't you're gonna come back out and they're gonna be seized up that's one thing I do every year with my rod and reels is I, I clean them up um, I either take them to my buddy um, and he takes them apart and lubes them and stuff for me. But every time I come in from a fishing trip, they all get washed down. They get that salt off of them. And my boat also gets washed every time I come down too. So um, keep, the, keep the boat clean. But other than that, that's really all I got. I, I want to open it up to questions. I don't know where we're at for time.